world. Their accomplishments are a study in opposites. Out of this world, down to earth. High tech, high touch. But while Elon and Kimball Musk's means may differ, their end is the same, to push humanity forward to greener pastures and beyond. They were born and raised in South Africa, but Elon came to America first, earning undergraduate degrees in both business and physics before briefly attending Stanford in 1995. My brother was in Canada at the time, and I said, look, I think we should try to create an internet company. So he came down and joined me. Elon was more the, the, the business mastermind, I was more the sales guy. Their first venture, Zip2, sold to Compaq in 1999. Kimball was an early investor in Elon's next company, which would eventually become PayPal and sell to eBay in 2002. In the years following, Kimball pursued the culinary arts, eventually landing in Colorado. I'm one of the founders of The Kitchen, which is a restaurant in Boulder, Colorado. It's a nationally recognized restaurant. While Kimball was pioneering local farm-to-table cuisine at what would become a family of four renowned restaurants, Brother Elon was charting a different course. When I was in, in university, I thought about what, what are the problems that are most likely to affect the future of the world. In 2002, Elon founded Space Exploration Technologies. SpaceX continues America's mission to resupply the International Space Station from U.S. soil. I'm talking about sending ultimately tens of thousands, eventually millions of people to Mars and then going out there and exploring the stars. In 2003, he founded Tesla Motors to build all electric cars. So we had a $100,000 sports car, which was the Roadster. Then we've got the Model S, which starts at around $50,000. And our, our third generation car, which will hopefully be out in about three or four years, uh, will be a $30,000 car. The winner, by unanimous decision, Tesla Model S. In 2006, he became chairman of Solar City the largest full-service provider of solar power in the country. Meanwhile, Kimball, while also serving on the boards of SpaceX and Tesla, found another cause. Obesity is the epidemic of our day. So I created a nonprofit called The Kitchen Community. And what we do is we help put learning gardens in schools around the country to fight childhood obesity and to improve test scores. When you teach kids in the garden, you can increase scores by over 15 points on a 100-point scale. Restaurateurs literally means restorers. Let's energize and connect our community. Let's do it with kids, and let's do it with real food. With their unique forms of disruptive innovation, the Musk brothers are creating the future while holding fast to the ideals of family, teamwork, and service that got humanity this far in the first place. Pretty amazing. You, th you, th you think their mom's proud? So leading the conversation with Alon and Jeff, Alon and Kimball is, is Jeff Skoll. As you, as you all know, Jeff is one of the planet's true visionary leaders in a number of fields. As a business innovator, he was the first full-time employee of eBay, and he led the company's emergence into a transformative trading platform that democratized economic opportunity throughout the world. In 1999, Jeff founded the Skoll Foundation, which quickly became the world's largest foundation for social entrepreneurship. And in 2004, he founded Participant Media with the belief that a well-told story has the power to inspire change. Jeff has been the executive producer now on over 39 films, which have garnered five Oscars and 35 nominations. In 2009, Jeff founded the Skoll Global Threats Fund, with a focus on the five issues that, if unchecked, could endanger the future of our planet. His many awards in include Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, Business Week's 50 Most Generous Philanthropists, and the John W. Gardner Leadership Award. We're honored and delighted, truly delighted, to welcome Jeff Skoll and his conversation with Lon and Kimball Musk. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Paul, for the, uh, the very generous introduction. Um, my name is Jeff Skoll, and I'm delighted to be here with my good friends Elon and Kimball Musk, 
Uh, in fact, we're in for a treat. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm usually the one that gets asked the question, so this uh, is, is a chance for me to put the shoe on the other foot. And it's also the first time Elon and Kimball have been on a panel together. Uh, I first met Elon in 1995 when he was dating a classmate of mine. Um, not long after that, I, I dated the same girl. <laughs> and, and I realized then that Elon always likes to be first. <laughs> uh, I've known Kimball for about a decade. Uh, Kimball runs four restaurants in Colorado, and he's invested heavily in learning gardens, which uh, I hope he'll talk about uh, at length tonight. Uh, Elon is the CEO of both uh, Tesla Motors and SpaceX, and he's the chairman of SolarCity. But the first question for both of you, what, what do you admire about each other? <laughs> oh, I, I, I want to do it first. Um, so I, I, uh, I, I, Elon knows this, but the, um, the advantage of being his younger brother is, is I kind of used to get what he wanted, and he wanted a lot of stuff. And so uh, the one time, I remember, we, 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 he wanted motorbikes. I was too young. Well, I was, <laughs> he was seven, I think, and I was six or something like that which in this country is not very common to get motorbikes. But one of the, one of the great things I admire about Elon is when he, when he wants something, he really wants it, and he goes and gets it. And it's amazing to watch him do that as his, as his brother, and, and he's done it throughout his life. Interesting. Um, well, I think uh, Kimball uh, is just one of the, the, ni the, the, the nicest people I, I know in the world. Um, I've, I've never in all, um, all my life seen Kimball intentionally do a mean thing. Um, so I admire that a great deal. Uh, the, the, the two of you, as I understand it, uh, I mean, uh, entrepreneurs are interesting because they often get started at a young age uh, d doing entrepreneurial ventures of some kind. And uh, I understand that when you were still in South Africa, you had a, a venture of some kind. Yeah, the, uh, the video arcade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The, 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 yeah, we had the, this brilliant idea to start a video arcade because um, we really knew what games were popular. Yeah, um, and also we were video game experts uh, at 14 and 15. Uh, yeah. And the reason we had to stop was because we went to the city to get a, a, a code variance and you need to be 18 to sign. And we had never told our parents. And uh, we already had a lease, we had uh, games coming. <laughs> And uh, when the parents found out, they put a stop to it, which is a real bummer because it would have been very successful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I'm glad that wasn't the, uh, the, the final barrier to success. Um, but you, you, that, that was the first time that you worked together uh, as brothers. And <laughs> um, eventually that led to a company called Zip2. Right. Uh, I, I wonder if you wouldn't mind uh, talking about Zip2. How did it come about? Uh, what was the idea? What was the, what was the whole process like for you? Uh, sure. Um, well, and Kimball, do you want to do you want to start off, or should it? Well, I mean, I would start with the road trip. The road trip. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so a year before, this is '94. We took, Elon was working at some video game company in, uh, there's a theme here. What? Yeah. <laughs> I was actually working, I was doing two jobs. Uh, one was at a video company, a video game company that was ironically called Rocket Science. Um, <laughs> and, and then working on ultra, um, ultra capacitors during the day for le electric cars. Um, and so uh, we went on a road trip from Silicon Valley to Philadelphia, and it was in 94, and we were both. I'm younger than Elon, but we were both finishing school at the same time, because I'm much smarter than him. <laughs> um, <and laughs> um, Elon actually was doing a double major, so uh, that's why. He, uh, but anyway, so uh, we ended up doing that, and um, the, uh, uh, we, went, we started with a medical, net network medical database. Remember that? Yeah. Well, there were a bunch of iterations, uh, yeah. but um, I think the, 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 the thought in 95 was that the internet was going to be something really that fundamentally changed humanity. It was like humanity acquiring a, a nervous system. You know, previously, uh, p people would c communicate information almost by osmosis, uh, relative to how the internet works. Um, you know, if you wanted to have access to a lot of information, like you'd go to like the Library of Congress, 
but um, unless you were physically where the books were, you, you didn't have access to that information. But with the internet, um, you could be anywhere in the world, and if you're connected to the internet, you have access to all the world's information. So it was really just like the humanity was almost becoming like a superorganism with um, a nervous system. So we want to be part of you know, building some elements of that. And it was a funny time because it made so much sense to us, but we had literally had a guy throw us throw a Yellow Pages book at us. He was a very senior executive, and um, tell us, do you, do you ever really think the internet is going to replace this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and literally, and you're kind of looking at them, going, "This guy's screwed." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He didn't, and people didn't know what the internet was. Yeah. Uh, including in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Yeah, there was like something that universities and like the government used and nobody was really doing anything on it and you certainly couldn't make money. Yeah. yeah. So. Did, did you know that you were on to something right away or did people just think you were crazy and pursuing some bizarre dream? Uh, when, when, when did it occur to you that Zip2 might be a success? Well, uh, I mean, we, we, when we first started out, uh, I think our ambitions were really quite, quite low. Um, it was really to make enough money to pay the rent. Yeah, um, we, we, we got a VC so to give us money. That was, yay. Yeah. We, th we thought it was all over then. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. <laughs> I mean, when we started out in 95, we, we literally, at the beginning, we had one computer, which um, would be the web server during the day, and, and then at night, I'd program on it. Um, <laughs> and. And we'd sleep in the office. Yeah, we, we, we couldn't afford to, to yeah, have an apartment. It, it was cheaper to rent the office than to rent an apartment. So we just rented the office and slept in the office and showered at the showered YMCA. Showered at the YMCA. And yeah. for me, the worst part was eating a Jack in the Box three times a day. <laughs> yeah. Man, this, this is like, <laughs> I'll, I'll sleep it's in really difficult to get food at Palo Alto after <laughs> like 10 p.m. Um, it's like Jack in the Box and a few other options. <laughs> so we, we rotated through the Jack in the Box menu. I remember the one time I was literally at Jack in the Box. Hopefully, you guys aren't whoever's from the companies out here. And it was it was one of those like three in the morning things. And it was I took a milkshake, and I was so tired. And there was something in the milkshake, <laughs> and I literally went like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's your standards just dropped to to, to nothing. Yeah. So so. Uh, yeah, we're in, in, through, the, through the end of 95, we're, that's essentially we're just sleeping in the office and chowing at the YMCA. And then, um, and then around the end of 95 is when Netscape went public. And, and then whether or not somebody knew what the internet was, they knew that you could make money on the internet somehow, um, or even if it's only on the greater fool theory. So uh, when we went and talked to venture capitalists in uh, early 96, there was a much greater um, interest in what we were doing. Um, in fact, the round closed in like maybe a week or something. It's crazy. Yeah, we yeah. went from sleeping in the office to people throwing. I mean, again, this is a financial crowd, so you guys see these numbers every day. But for us to hear, we'll give you three million dollars. Yeah, for, it sounded extremely. We thought they were crazy. Like, I why mean, would they was, do that? It was literally like <laughs> these people are insane. They obviously do not realize we're sleeping in the office. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, when they when they did fund us, yeah. they they realized that we were illegal immigrants. Well, I mean, yes, we were. I'd say we were. it was a gray area. Yeah, yes, we were. I was, I was, yeah, we were illegal immigrants. We were sleeping in the office. We didn't have a car. We had one car, but the wheel kept falling off. But, well, actually, yeah, the, the, the wheel did actually fall off the car. Yes, exactly. Um, and, the, and the venture capitalists actually <laughs> bought us cars. Yeah, well, they, they gave us 40 grand. Um, it was 40 grand to go buy cars, which was, at the time was more money than we've ever seen. Yeah, and, and I, I bought a... a, a port, I spent 35k on a Series 167 um, Jaguar uh, E-Type, um, <laughs> which didn't drive, but he, but he got what he wanted. <laughs> yeah, it, it looked really great by the side of the road. Um, <laughs> he, he, he got it. He was driving it home from the dealer, and it, and it broke down, and he had to actually was, come to the house with a, <laughs> on a flatbed truck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. It didn't, and it didn't improve from there. I mean, it was really. He should have kept the truck. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it reminds me in some ways of, uh, you know, eBay went public in yeah. 1998 and we had kind of the scrappy startup mentality as well. And uh, the, the first time I ever saw Elon on, t on TV was uh, when you took delivery of um, oh, a, yeah. a McLaren supercar. That's right. Um, so, yeah. Um, 
<laughs> right. So, pre so, so presumably somewhere between sleeping on the floor of the office and yeah. the McLaren, uh, something happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so at, at Zip2 we basically created uh, software to help bring the media companies online. So we, um, it was sort of internet uh, publishing software, it was the yellow pages, white pages, uh, maps and directions, that kind of thing. And, um, and we helped bring some of the major media companies online, or at least a, a portion of what their online presence was. And so we had as customers and investors, uh, New York Times Company, Knight Ritter, Hearst, and most of the major uh, media companies. Um, and then we In fact, the guy that threw the telephone book at us eventually became an investor. Yeah. Right. And then the company sold uh, to Compaq uh, right. for a little over 300 million. Yeah. Uh, circa 1999, late late 90s. Yeah, that's right. It was uh, yeah. We think the deal was sort of struck late 98, and then it concluded early 99. Yeah. And so, so then what happens to you guys? I mean, at that point, you're 23, 24 years old, give or take, and you, you've gone from uh, being barely able to pay the rent to having uh, substantial resources. How, how did that influence your paths in what you did next? The way I, I like to think about it is I was like a dog in a cage getting beaten for four <laughs> years, and then they let me out, and here are all the T-bones you can eat. Uh, so it was a very weird experience, actually, because you don't think I, I thought I was building that company for life, and then, boom, they you know they give you lots and lots of money in easy to carry bags, and <laughs> it was totally surreal. And and what did you do? So I went to New York. So I I, I was done with Silicon Valley. I think technology is, a, is my brother's thing. He loves it, and I, I I enjoy it too. But but honestly, for me, food is what. I've always been passionate since I was a kid. I was the cook in the family. And so ironic, he's much thinner than I am. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, I can eat anything. Although I'm finding yeah. out as you get older, it doesn't work out that way. Yeah. Uh, but no, so I went to New York uh, and I learned to cook. I went to the, uh, you know, I was young and I, I figured, you know, what, what else do you do when you have enough financial resources to do whatever you want? Uh, and I always wanted to learn to cook. So I enrolled in, in a cooking school, one of the top schools in the country in New York City and had this incredible experience of uh, cooking with some of the best, most talented chefs in the world. And um, a, it was a unique circumstance for me personally because I was there in New York during 9-11 and, and I graduated from cooking school just before 9-11 and I lived right by the World Trade Center. So I saw the, everything happen. It was a very big event in my life. Uh, but what the rare opportunity it gave me uh, was the opportunity to cook for the firefighters. So I spent six weeks at Ground Zero cooking for the firefighters, and that's when I kind of, my, I always loved food, but my passion for community and connecting uh, people to, to, uh, to each other through food was just an, I mean, I literally couldn't even describe how, how incredible this experience was. And so I came out of that with a very strong intention to, to start a restaurant. And, uh, having been part of a company that just sold for 300 million and investing in PayPal, which at the time was worth billions of dollars, doing a restaurant was a weird decision. But for me, it was the right decision. So for you, it unlocked uh, a, a path to dreams that m maybe you had beforehand or just opportunistically, you just said, this is what I want to do. And, and you, you still... Uh, not only run the, the, the restaurant you began, but th there's more to it. Uh, yeah, well, do uh, you mean the nonprofit, or do you mean? No, I mean, uh, just in terms of there are more than one restaurant. Oh, yeah, sure. So, you know, uh, I, I, um, uh, I, I, turns out I'm actually pretty good at cooking. I didn't, I didn't really know I was good at cooking, but, but when I opened the restaurant uh, with a, I had two partners, uh, Hugo and Jen, we opened the restaurant. We were supposed to do 60 people a night and it was just going to be the side project for me because I was still involved in Elon's companies, Tesla and, and SpaceX. And uh, you know, today we serve 10,000 people a week. You know, and it just, just continues to grow. Um, uh, Elon, for you, uh, Zip2 happened, you sold it, and... It, uh, <laughs> and, and bought the McLaren, yeah. <laughs> um, and if I'm not mistaken, yeah. you, you invested most of that money into your next, uh, your next venture, uh, x.com. That's right. Um, so uh, yeah, most of, most of the funds went into x.com, which was re later renamed uh, PayPal. Um, and 
Uh, yeah, and that worked out pretty well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it worked out pretty well, but looking, looking back on it, um, would, because you put a lot of your eggs in, in that basket, would, right. you, would you advise entrepreneurs to roll the bones quite the way you did? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, I think so. Um, I, think, I, think, I think it's worth investing your own capital in, in what you do. I, I don't believe in the sort of other people's money thing. Um, you know, I think if you're not willing to put your own um, assets at stake, then you shouldn't ask other people to do, the, to do that. Um, so eBay comes along, buys PayPal, um, and then I, I, I remember 2003, give or take, uh, meeting Elon at a, at a coffee shop in Palo Alto. This was not long after the PayPal uh, deal had closed. And I said to Elon, what would you like to do next? And, and you had three things to say. Right. Do, do you remember what they were? Uh, well, uh, um, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I mean, they're basically, you know, space, solar, and electric cars. Space, yeah. solar, and electric cars, <laughs> yes, two points. But yeah. <laughs> um, Wait, space, electric cars, what was the middle one? Uh, well, as, uh, so uh, I asked Elon what he wanted to do, and he, um, he, he said he wanted to do something in solar power. He wanted to uh, colonize Mars eventually, uh, but, to, but to get there by uh, building a rocket business, a sustainable business, and, and building electric cars. And uh, par, par, let, let's talk a little bit about, uh, about Mars. Okay. <laughs> uh, so wh where, did, where did this come from? When, when did you have that dream? How did that come to be? Um, well, um, I guess you know, when I was in college, that I, I thought about things that would most affect the future of humanity. And, and there were uh, three areas that I thought would have the biggest impact. And those were the internet, sustainable energy, of which uh, solar power is the production side, and um, uh, electric cars the consumption side. And then um, humanity becoming a multi-planet species. And I think our future will fundamentally bifurcate to one where we are a space-bearing civilization or one where we are confined to Earth until some eventual extinction event. Although I'm quite optimistic about life on Earth, I should point out. I wanna, <laughs> sometimes people think that, that by that uh, I expect some imminent uh, catastrophe. But um, I, th I think that the probable, probable outcome for civilization is, on Earth is, is quite quite good for a long time. Um, but I still think that we should uh, try to extend life beyond Earth and have a, and the thing to do is to establish a base on Mars and ultimate, and, and try to make that a self-sustaining base as soon as possible. Um, so uh, I, mean, I don't expect that SpaceX is gonna do that sort of single-handedly, but I think we're, we're, we're gonna try to advance the technology of space travel to the point where um, we can at least send some number of people to Mars, which is not currently possible. Um, as I recall, uh, when... Yeah, follow-up question, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when, when SpaceX started, I think the first three rocket launches weren't successful. Yeah. And, and, the, and the fourth one was. Um, what would have happened if the fourth one hadn't worked? We would have failed, yeah. But, but let's talk about the... Th one of the, the, the failures were spectacular. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, so I would go out to the island, the Kwajalein with Elon, yeah. and seeing giant exploding rockets is quite an amazing sight. Uh, and uh, I was one of the early investors in SpaceX, and I said, you know what, if all I get to do is to see these rockets explode, <laughs> it's well worth every dime I put into this company. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's something to be said about brotherly support. <laughs> but it was an amazing thing to watch uh, what Elon would, had built with those rockets in, I mean, on a shoestring in the middle of nowhere, and literally the middle of the Pacific, 2,000 miles from Hawaii. Uh, and uh, that experience, we'd fly in these, these what are they called? Uh, the, what are those the Hueys? helicopters? The Hueys. You're flying the Hueys. You feel like you're right out of, out of uh, Apocalypse Now, flying to Dr. Evil's Island. 
really amazing. I mean, yeah. and again, worth every penny, still to this day, I'd say. <laughs> so uh, I, I think the failures were actually unbelievably exciting to be part of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eli. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, I mean, the, 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 point, the point being that um, these ventures now seem to have a wonderful momentum and things are going well, but I, I remember well there was a point in time yes. when, when e each of them uh, had their, their tipping point and could have gone either way. I wonder, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the origins of Tesla. Sure. Um, so with the... Uh, um, I, I mean, as mentioned, I was quite interested in electric cars from when I was doing my undergrad physics. And um, in fact, I originally came out to California to do a PhD at Stanford in applied physics and material science to work on ultra capacitors in electric cars. Um, so it was a, a long-standing interest of mine. And, um, and the internet kind of put that on hold for a few, few years. But then once, after PayPal, I, I decided I wanted to get back into um, electric vehicles. and. Um, make something happen in that arena, particularly since um, GM had, had come out with the EV1. And, and I thought, OK, well, there's not really a need for a startup company to develop electric cars, because obviously GM is going to create the EV2 and the EV3, that's logical sequence. And um, it will get increasingly you know, get better and better with each iteration. Um, and so not really need for, for, for a new company in that arena. Um, but, but actually what happened was that after California changed the regulations to no longer require electric cars, uh, GM recalled all the EV1s. And then just to make sure that nobody could get them back, they crushed them in a, in a, in a lot somewhere. Um, mm. and, and in fact, um, while they were being crushed, the, the, the people who had been the EV1 owners who did not want those cars recalled actually held a candle at vigil as though somebody was getting wow. executed, basically. Um, and it's like, that just seemed extremely crazy that GM would ignore this because um, you know, it's quite rare for people to hold a candle at vigil about a product. Um, <laughs> hmm. And particularly a GM product. <laughs> so <laughs> you know. yeah. so if, if, if people are doing that, you should really pay attention. Um, but but they, they, they wanted to just sort of erase all that. And uh, so I thought, OK, well, we've got, we've got to try to create an electric car company. But it, it wasn't as though in creating these companies that we thought that we would be successful. Um, I thought that the most likely outcome was failure. Um, but, but it was still worth doing, even though the, the odds of success were low. In fact, even for, for, for SpaceX, the, originally what I started doing was not creating a rocket company, but, but actually was going to do um, a small mission to Mars, which was just a philanthropic mission where you we would send a, a small greenhouse with seeds and dehydrated gel. In the, we would, um, upon landing, hydrate the gel, and you'd have this cool picture of green plants on a red background. And the public tends to respond to precedents and superlatives. So this would be the first life on Mars, furthest that life's ever traveled. Um, and you'd have this great money shot of green plants on a red background. <laughs> so um, yeah, I thought that would, that would get people's attention. So. Um, but, but the expectation for that was, was no return. So the I, I thought we, we wouldn't get any, uh, you know, we'll just spend the money on that and it wouldn't, wouldn't happen. And um, it was in the process of trying to do that mission that I concluded that um, I'd made a mistake with respect to uh, my assumptions about why, uh, why, why, why are there are no people on Mars. Because um, I, I started off thinking that it was because there was a lack of will. Um, and that if you could reignite the will, then, then it would happen. So my initial thing, with, with, even with the space side, was, was really to get the public excited and to, to get people to um, uh, essentially vote NASA to have a bigger budget. That was my goal initially. Um, and, um, but as, as I tried to, do, tried to do that mission, I was able to compress the costs of the, uh, the satellite or the spacecraft and, and the um, the greenhouse and everything, and the communication costs, but I wasn't able to compress the, 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 rocket, to tra the rocket costs. And I actually tried, uh, <laughs> had some adventures along the way trying to, trying to get a good deal on rockets. I actually flew to Russia three times to try to buy a, a, some ICBMs. <laughs> uh, and I negotiated a deal, too, actually. Um, 
But um, after the third trip to, to Russia, uh, uh, which was, it was very, very strange, because I was like there in 2001, 2002. Um, and uh, I, I, I thought, well, if, if we do this, well, it's, it, it, it's going to generate a lot of interest. But um, if, the, if there's still a fundamental technology issue with rocket transport, then it's not going to solve the problem. So I decided that um, it, was, it was not a question of will. It was a question of, of way. And if, if people thought there was a way to do it without it fundamentally affecting their standard of living, then they would support such an endeavor, particularly in the United States, which the United States is a, um, is a nation of explorers. I mean, it's a distillation of the human spirit of exploration. People came here from other places. And, uh, and so it, it, that, I think that, that, that exploratory spirit is, is actually very strong. Um, but people need to know that, that it's possible, this can, this can be done without materially affecting their standard of living. So. Uh, I mean, what, what you've accomplished uh, is, is amazing. Um, between linking up with the, with the space station on launches and uh, the Model S winning car of the year and, and, and being just a phenomenon. Um, but you, a good, yes. <laughs> so, so, um, I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing, and, and we'll come back and talk about Solar City in a second. But you, you mentioned uh, gardens, and I think that's a, a natural segue. We're surrounded by some uh, beautiful gardens here on stage. And Kimball, I wonder if you might want to talk a little bit about, about these. Sure. Um, so uh, the restaurants that we do in Colorado are, uh, before farm to table was a term, we, we work with local farmers and bring local food to the tables. And we really consider ourselves a community restaurant. And one of the things we did as part of the community was to reach out to kids in the community in schools and get them connected to food through school gardens. And uh, we, you know, we'd bring them into the restaurant and we'd you know, do everything from give them chicken liver pate without telling them what it was. And they would you know, thoroughly enjoy it. And, and then you tell them, then they spit it out of their mouth. <laughs> and you know, it's like fun things like that that we, would, we just did as a, as, a, as a great way to connect into the community. And then um, I, uh, I had a personal accident, um, a, a very severe accident. I was pr paralyzed on my left and horizontal for two months after breaking my neck. And uh, just ha it really helped me focus on, well, let me go back to having a more of an impact on society. And I know there's a lot of philanthropists in the crowd, and I have a lot of respect for that. But for me, it was very much about how can I give back, but in a way that really I understood and, and could, could really see the, see the impact. And I'd been working with these school gardens for many years. And so I came up with this idea called the Learning Garden, which you, you see beautifully presented. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy, for, for, for doing this. Uh, and what we do is it's a nonprofit. Uh, we go to schools around the country, and we install these outdoor learning environments that are school gardens. And they're very different to traditional school gardens. Uh, traditional school gardens being in the corner of the schoolyard with a fence around it. These are designed to be in the schoolyard, on the playground, where the kids will see it every day. The hundreds of kids will enjoy it and, and, and play with it every day. And it's made out of the same materials, playground equipment, so it'll last for decades, unlike traditional school gardens, which are very, very temporary. Uh, we also came up with this idea to make it more modular so that you could fit it in any schoolyard. Uh, rooftops, asphalt, there's a lot of toxic soil, sadly, in our cities where you literally couldn't put a garden there if you wanted to. And these are all, we were designed to uh, be FDA approved just for food, for growing food. And so what I did was um, really look at the problem based on the experience that I had uh, working with Elon and uh, working in whether it's manufacturing or operations or uh, 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 politics, frankly, which is a, is a very big political problem. And you know, what, what value could I add? And uh, there are lots of great gardeners out there. And I'll be the first to tell you I'm not a gardener. Uh, but, I, but I really believed in the impact that these were having. And, and the data is amazing. I mean, we, we see a doubling of vegetable intake when kids have a learning garden on their schoolyard, literally a doubling from two and a half to five portions a day. Uh, we see test, uh, test scores, particularly in science, go up by 15 points on a 100-point scale when they get taught the same science lesson in the learning garden versus in the classroom. This incredible impact on their lives. And the challenge was not a question of school gardens. That had already been proven. The challenge was how do you scale? How do you get something that will reach 100,000 schools within a few years? Because that's the problem we have. Well, childhood obesity is today's problem. It is not tomorrow's problem. 20% of underserved kids go, are going into kindergarten 
obese. Uh, it's an awful tragedy. We have these poor children that are not only obese, but they're actually starving because the food we're giving them has no nutrients. It has calories, but no nutrients. And it's just this awful, awful situation, a real tragedy that, we've, that we're creating. And so for me, what I wanted to do was how do I come in and say, OK, I know what I know. Uh, I know what I think I can do well. Let me see what I can create that could actually go into 100,000 schools within a few years. And so, so I created the Learning Garden with this idea to, by the end of this decade, to, to reach every child that wants one or every school that wants one. Um, and we have, that, we have the capacity. Now what we need is the political will to, to go do it. And so we'll have about 200 installed this year. And we started two years ago. And uh, we did one two years ago. We did 50 last year. We'll do about 200 this year. Hopefully 1,000 next year, and then many thousands after that. Uh, Kim, Kimball, if people are interested in finding more out about the learning gardens, um, where would they go? Uh, Thekitchencommunity.org. Please go. If you're a superintendent, and I know there's some superintendents <laughs> in this room, because I had a, uh, some heated conversations with you guys earlier. Uh, <laughs> please go learn about it, because there's no better way to teach kids about science, which we all understand is a massive problem in this country. Getting our kids to love science is so important. And childhood obesity is so important. We need to fix this problem. We are creating expensive, unproductive people. Let's just stop that. Let's fix the problem. Let's fix it now. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Solar City, yeah? And then maybe open up uh, to questions uh, from the audience. Um, Solar City, uh, uh, I mean, your, your family is uh, uh, r r remarkable. Um, maybe you want to talk a little bit about how Solar City got going and your, your role as chairman and, and uh, all sure. that. So, well, <clears throat> uh, so Solar City was founded by two cousins of ours, uh, Lyndon and Peter Rive, who are really great guys. Um, and before Solar City, they had a company called Everdream which did large-scale management of computers and, and other assets, electronic assets, uh, which was sold to Dell, um, and that did, did pretty well. So, uh, and, and the genesis of, of Solar City was actually, um, you know, we, we were Burning Man with our cousins, and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, they, were, they were thinking about what to do next, and I said, well, I, I think there's um, a real need for, um, for great entrepreneurs in the solar industry. And, um, and I said, if, if, if they were willing to start a sol solar power company, then uh, I would completely back them on that. So they, they took me up on the offer and uh, created Solar City, which um, what Solar City is essentially is a giant uh, distributed utility. Uh, or it's, I'd say right now it's a small distributed utility, but it will be hopefully a giant distributed utility. Um, and, uh, and it's obviously one that's based on, on the sun, which are, that giant fusion reactor in the sky. Um, so it's, it's something that'll last for, for a very long time. Um, I, I ultimately think that uh, we will generate uh, more energy from solar power than from any other source. In, in fact, it's worth noting that the, uh, the planet is already almost entirely solar powered um, in that we would be a frozen ice ball at three Kelvin if not for the sun. And the sun powers our whole system of precipitation and the, the ecosystem. So, um, so really, we're just talking about a little bit of extra power that um, humanity uses for, to, to run civilization, essentially. But it's really quite a small amount um, relative to the amount that actually hits the Earth. Right. And, and Solar City went public uh, a few months back. Yeah, it went public in, in December. It was quite a difficult IPO. Um, and uh, we were able to get it through, um, and uh, now it's doing, doing reasonably well. Well, there are amazing successes uh, on, on both your parts. Um, we're going to go to questions from the audience, assuming uh, these monitors work. Um, <laughs> as, as of the moment, they're not. And if not, then uh, I will, oh, I, I, I see a monitor coming on here. <laughs> um, all right. What, what are the key traits, skills, or circumstances that have allowed you to be so successful? Uh, 
I don't know. Why don't you answer for me? Or, or do you, what yeah, do you I'll think? I'll answer for you. That's a great idea. Uh, so the, uh, I, I live in a small town in Colorado uh, called Boulder. And uh, my, my joke is I grew up in South Africa during the collapse of apartheid. Very, very difficult time. Then I went to California during the rise of the internet. Exciting, but difficult time. Then I was in New York City during 9-11. Difficult time. Now I'm in this little small town in Boulder waiting for some serious shit to go down. <laughs> uh, so I think those had uh, very big impacts on me. And I think the, the, the impact personally is constant uh, uh, paranoia, I guess. It's maybe it's better. I hate to say that, not in a negative way, but it's, uh, you're just kind of, you know, you're waiting for something really intense to happen all the time. So I think that just keeps you on your toes and, and keeps you moving forward. Um, yeah, I think uh, just uh, obviously being, being tenacious and uh, uh, being, uh, well, I, I think just being super focused on, on the truth is ex extremely important and looking for uh, feedback from all sources. Um, I think those, those are really key. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I'd also add, know, knowing both of you, is that you're very detail-oriented. Uh, there, there's no small part uh, of the experience that doesn't get attention from you. Um, so uh, uh, another, another question that I had, you know, uh, Elon, you've, you've been compared to Henry Ford, Richard Branson, um, <laughs> you know, Steve Jobs. Uh, who do you compare yourself to? Um, I don't really compare myself to anyone. Um, I mean, it's not... Um I mean, there's certain people that I admire from history that I think are, you know, I think are great. Um, sort of certainly many of the scientists and engineers and literary figures and so forth. Um, and uh, like, I'm, I'm a big, big fan of uh, Ben Franklin. You know, he was a scientist and sort of thinker. And I mean, he was the kind of guy who who did, did did what needed to be done. You know, so I, like guys like that, I right. Wouldn't say I compare myself in any way, but I, I certainly admire them. Uh, are, are, there, are there people you, you look up to? I, I think the, the two that I look up to in my way, I look the same thing as Enos, kind of look back. Uh, I love Winston Churchill. Yeah, he's cool. <laughs> he's the, <laughs> that, that guy, I think, is, was one of the greatest gifts to mankind. And I think Steve Jobs. Right. Yeah. And I think the thing that, that makes me like these people is that they put their passion into their work and it's not about the job. It's not about coming to work. It's about creating, making a difference in, in your society. And I think that that's what, what I have always admired with my brother and with anyone else. You know, one, one thing I've observed from my own entrepreneurial history is that uh, people that start out building a company to make a lot of money uh, almost invariably fail. It's, it's people that start out uh, with, with a, a dream or something that they're passionate about and they care about, and the money just kind of comes as, well, as I, think, I think if you think about it, you can get money both ways, but if uh, we have a mutual friend of ours, uh, Bill Lee, who has this phrase that doing, starting a business from scratch is like chewing glass and looking into the abyss. <laughs> it is really, really hard. And if you don't like your glass sandwich, you're gonna have a miserable, miserable life. And so it's a very important lesson. Do what you're passionate about, because no matter what you do, if it's making a difference, it's super hard to do it. And so you better enjoy. You better be passionate about it. Let's see if we have any other questions uh, from from the audience. Yeah. Uh, next next question, please. For Kimball, uh, what role and impact do you see impact investing in social ventures? having in solving the world's major problems? Um, so I actually get this question asked to me a lot. I was just, literally had this conversation with a, with a major social investor a week ago. Uh, I really struggle with it, to be honest. Um, I think the idea of, uh, obviously, investing as a philanthropist, I love. I think that's really great. But if you're looking for a financial return, it is super hard to not have that as your key driver. Uh, I get the idea of double bottom line or triple bottom line, and I, I live that life all day long, but it's a personal decision of mine, and um, I, I really do struggle with the right answer because 
the more money you make, the more d difference you can make in philanthropy, and you can separate the two, and you can be quite impactful as a philanthropist. If you're a financier on Wall Street, you can choose to, I mean, I'm sure once you reach a certain point, everything you do will be for philanthropy after that, and that makes a big difference in the world. If you chose to invest in social ventures and get a smaller return, I think you, you struggle. Uh, you actually, success is very important. And so I really believe in isolating uh, the, the problem, focus on success, getting it done. And in the case of investing, that means focusing on investing and getting the highest possible return within reason, uh, you know, human rights and all that stuff. But, but um, social investing, I think, is a very difficult space to, to uh, make work. And actually, maybe, Jeff, you should answer that question because you, you do that all the time. Uh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, except I'm sitting in this chair. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I agree with you. I, I think you know, so, social investing has all the rigor and challenges of uh, for-profit investing, but added into that is the qualitative, sometimes unmeasurable uh, aspects of dealing with some sort of social change or, or social good. Uh, so, one of the things I actually, I mean, on the nonprofit side, I was specifically referring to for-profit social ventures. Which, but on the nonprofit side, I get really frustrated because there is no measuring stick. It's how are you doing? You get to measure yourself. That's retarded. You need to have, you need to have some measuring, some some common grounded measuring stick. And in the in in the for-profit world, you've got profit. And in the nonprofit world, it's very weird. It's my first nonprofit, so I'm, I'm learning as I go. I don't know what the answer is. Elon, anything to add on that? Um, well, um, I mean, um, but I think gener generally anything that, that if, if it's possible to solve a problem um, with, a, with a profitable venture, then it's, that's the best thing to do. So it's only when like, the, there's some failure in the market, um, and, and, the, and there are some, but Actually, aren't that many, but in the grand scheme of things, there are some failures in the market that have to be addressed with a, with a, with a non-profit. Um, and, uh, but, but generally, I'd say, are, are on the side of pro I mean, I do have a small foundation there. No, no. So as long as I'm against giving stuff, I do. Elon's the stuff. biggest donor to the non-profit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, ge yeah, generally, if, if, if there's a way to fix the market system, that's the better way to do it. Um, but sometimes there isn't, or it's, there are complications in doing it. How, how is the Elon of 2013 different from the Elon of the Zip2 days? Uh, what have you learned? Uh, well, I've learned, I think, well, quite, quite a lot. A lot of Scotch history between, now and, between then and now. Um, I think, you know, I've mentioned this at, uh, at, at when I gave my talk at South by Southwest, but um, I think the, uh, I, 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 I've made several hiring decisions in the past which, where I valued um, intellect over heart, and I, and I think that was a mistake. Um, and so I've tried to, try to adjust accordingly. Um, you know, it, it, it actually matters whether somebody's a good person. It, beyond just, you know, goodness itself. It, it, right. Yeah. Uh, Kim Kimball, same question. Uh, the Kimball of 2013, uh, how are you different from the Zip2 days? Yeah, that's, as I say, as Elon said, that is a long time ago. Um, the um, uh, I, I would I would say I'm uh, much more comfortable with myself. I'm much more able to say no. You know, so if there's an opportunity in front of me that is very financially attractive or whatever, and it's not what I want to do, I just I know to say no. And you know, in the past, I I, I would always say yes, and I would get involved in things that that weren't what I was passionate about. And, so I think that's probably the most valuable thing I've learned. I think I uh, still have a lot to learn. So but that's. Uh, I think we have time for, for one last question. Uh, we got anything? Please wrap up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in that case, um, my last question is: Are are uh, are, are you uh, are, are you guys going to go to Mars together? <laughs> <laughs> we might. Uh, I think we, we, I mean, <laughs> when we're 95, what the hell else are we going to do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I think that'll be fun. Um, I don't think I would want to go before that, but. <laughs> 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 well, e e Elon has, has a famous line uh, about going to Mars. Right. 
would you mind repeating it? Uh, okay. <laughs> I mean, so yeah. I mean, I think I, I, um, I would like to die on Mars, but just not on impact. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I, I think on, on that note, I'd like to thank <laughs> Elon and Kimball for a wonderful panel. And thank, thank you. Thank you to the American folks. Pretty extraordinary. Let's have one more time for Elon and Kimball and Jeff. Thank you. All right. Before, before you all, all leave, we have a great late night show for you in the Beverly Hills Ballroom. Lionel Richie, David Foster, and Paul Anka. I'm reliving my childhood. Uh, and, and a series of special guests. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. Beverly Hills Ballroom, right down the hall. Thank you so much. <laughs>